All right. Well, hi, everyone. Um, we'll let some people get in and then we will start. All right. Hello, hello. We'll wait a couple more seconds just to get people in and then we will get started. Hope you all are uh, joining us from around the Red Hill social media realm and enjoying our social media posts. Um, I'm, of course, very excited to be here today. All right. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, well, hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, today's lecture, Death of a Patriot, Patrick Henry and Dying in the 18th Century. My name is Cody Youngblood, and I'm the Director of Historic Preservation and Collections here at Patrick Henry's Red Hill. And as a nonprofit, we're devoted to education and historic preservation, and we maintain and interpret Red Hill, Patrick Henry's last home and burial place, as a historic site. Now, I'm very excited to see everyone here, and I hope you all will enjoy the presentation. And if you have any questions, don't forget to uh, put them in the chat box wherever you're joining us from, uh, and those questions will be answered at the end. Now, uh, Death of a Patriot is one of several educational talks held throughout the year uh, as part of our Red Hill Rediscovered Lecture Series. And of course, we're very grateful to our uh, funders at Virginia Humanities for helping us continue these programs. If you'd like to learn about uh, more programs coming up in the year 2024, please visit us online at redhill.org for a full schedule. Now, today we're going to be talking about one of my favorite subjects, death. And it better be your favorite subject, too, because we all get a pretty good education uh, in it uh, one day. Now, before Patrick Henry uh, came to uh, the end of his life on June 6, 1799, the aging patriot spent the last 10 years of his life battling for retirement. And after being in the spotlight for nearly 30 years, this was certainly deserved. Henry left the House of Delegates in Virginia for the first time at the end of seven, for the last time at the end of 1790, but found himself embroiled in discussions over not a fully reconciled government. In fact, in one of his last acts as delegate, Henry introduced a resolution protesting the Funding Act of 1790, by which the federal government would assume the debts of the states, much of which dated from the uh, American Revolution. Now, the resolution passed, but an act of Congress ultimately carried out the uh, assumption of state debt. And Henry was dealing with the uh, emergence of the two-party system as well, which he felt, as did his friend George Washington, would be disastrous to a unified central government. With the rise of the new Republican Party, Henry feared, quote, disunion amongst the states from collusion of interest, but especially for the baneful effects of faction. And during his so-called retirement, Henry was also dealing with personal issues such as debt. His financial difficulties were owed in part to expenses while governor, and Henry sought to secure his family's fortune through land speculation and the practice of law. He did not travel as widely for cases as he did in the 1760s, confining his practice mostly to Prince Edward and Bedford counties, though uh, in a compelling case or for a large enough fee, uh, he would travel to Richmond or over the mountains uh, into present-day West Virginia. And one of the most significant cases argued by Henry in the 1790s was Ware versus Hylton, better known as the British debt case. The case involved British creditors who filed over 100 cases seeking to enforce claims from the Revolutionary War. Henry and his friend John Marshall were part of the defense team. Argued before a three-judge panel that included Chief Justice of the Supreme Court John Jay and Associate Justice James Iredell, Henry's remarks provoked Justice Iredell to exclaim, quote, Gracious God, he is an orator indeed. Henry and Marshall were initially successful, but the British creditors appealed to the Supreme Court, uh, who ruled in their favor in 1796. Now, the British debt case was a rare spotlight moment for Henry in this decade, who felt his burgeoning family needed uh, him more than anything else. For his years of support, George Washington felt indebted to Henry and tried to coax the orator out of uh, uh, out of retirement and back into government. And in 1794, Washington offered Henry a seat on uh, the Supreme Court, but he refused. Washington also tried to get Henry to accept positions as Secretary of State and a special envoy to Spain. 
Now, the letter you see here on the right uh, is in the Red Hill collection, and it's actually a draft copy of the letter Henry sent to Washington in October 1795, explaining his reasons for declining the positions of Secretary of State. Henry says, quote, My domestic situation pleads strongly against a removal to Philadelphia, having no less than eight children by my present marriage, and Mrs. Henry's situation now forbidding her approach to the smallpox, which neither herself nor any of our family ever had. To this may be added other considerations arriving, arising from loss of crops and consequent derangement of, fi of my finances. And what is of decisive weight with me, my own health and strength, I believe, are unequal to the duties of the station you are pleased to offer me. Now, Washington gracefully accepted Henry's refusal. Meanwhile, Virginia Governor Light Horse Harry Lee wanted to appoint uh, Henry to the U.S. Senate. He believed Henry fit the bill as someone who, quote, would feel themselves sufficiently engaged by attending to our own affairs and whose attachment to their own country is so great as to exclude attachment to other nations. Henry was not persuaded. Uh, the appointment was declined three days later. Even President John Adams uh, attempted to bring Henry back into the fold by appointing him minister to France in April 1799, but once again, Henry declined, citing bad health. By refusing these federal positions and thus political power in favor of his farm and family, this unintentionally increased Henry's popularity among the common man. And speaking of farms, Henry's retirement began with his move to Campbell County, Virginia, to Long Island Plantation in 1792. This 600-acre tract included the island in the Stanton River and the house overlooking the island on a bluff. But just two years later, Henry's favorite hobby of land acquisition struck again, and he purchased the 700-acre estate down the river from Long Island called Red Hill. Between 1794 and 1796, Henry moved between his two plantations, staying at Red Hill for about eight months out of the year, and Long Island to save him from what he called the sickly season. Henry, however, uh, was not so lucky, as his time at Red Hill was marked by illness. Incredibly, Henry wrote uh, himself wrote that he and his family had avoided contracting smallpox and dysentery, despite the latter affecting many in the county around Long Island. Henry did contract several bouts of malaria, no doubt due to his home's proximity uh, to several springs and rivers. In early 1799, Henry's health had worsened, and he had in fact given his last public speech at Charlotte Courthouse on March 4th of that year, still dealing with an unknown illness. As one eyewitness to the speech described Henry, quote, he was very infirm. At length, he rose with difficulty and stood somewhat bowed with age and weakness. His face was almost colorless. His countenance was careworn, and when he commenced his exordium, his voice was slightly cracked and tremulous. And it seems illnesses had not passed with time. In a letter to Robert Campbell on April 1st, 1799, Henry wrote these ominous words, quote, a complaint like the gravel has rendered it impossible for me to ride out today. I apply to Dr. Cabell for medical aid. Now, the term gravel is an 18th century medical term for kidney stones, and it's possible Henry was dealing with these during his speech uh, a month before. And although it seems out of the ordinary today, sickness and disease were commonplace in 18th century America. Smallpox was, of course, the most common and most feared infectious disease, but Virginians also suffered through typhoid fever, meningitis, anemia, tuberculosis, uh, scurvy, ringworm, ulcers, and more. Many of these illnesses were made worse by the primitive nature of 18th century medicine. Medical practitioners at this time looked backward to earlier centuries when few cures or effective treatments were available, and religion was invoked to halt epidemics. Physicians in Patrick Henry's time were only uh, just beginning to understand and comprehend disease theory, which enabled them to diagnose and treat based on that diagnosis. When some became ill, uh, a historian notes in 18th century Virginia, physicians treated them with the 17th century procedures of, quote, sweat, blister, purge, vomit, and bleed. Lovely depictions. Uh, and quite often the patient was uh, sicker after treatment than before. Disease caused incalculable death rates. And in colonial New England, tuberculosis was responsible for 20% of deaths each year. 
Scarlet fever killed 30 out of every 1,000 people in the colonies in the mid-18th century. Death disproportionately affected children, and in Salem, Massachusetts, 283 of every 1,000 infants died every year. This made death a constant rather than a rarity. And with death being at the forefront of people's minds since whites first landed in the Americas, people looked for ways to understand the inevitable. The Pilgrims, who landed at Plymouth in 1620, were Puritans, and their beliefs permeated every uh, American response to death. On the one hand, in line with long Christian tradition, the Puritans viewed death as a blessed release from the trials of this world into the joys of everlasting life. At the same time, the Puritans regarded death as God's punishment for human sinfulness, and uh, on their deathbeds, many New Englanders were actually trembling with fear uh, that they might suffer eternal damnation in hell. From the earliest upbringing, Puritans were taught to fear death. Ministers terrorized young children with graphic depictions of hell and the horrors of damnation and told them that at the last judgment, their own parents would testify against them. Adults, too, looked upon death with foreboding. Puritan ideology uh, denied that individuals had any assurance of salvation. God had decided their fate at the time of creation, which was known as predestination, and his will was inscrutable. It was a delusion to think that God in his mercy would forgive their sins and take them to heaven. Consequently, many Puritans suffered a desperate um, spiritual torment and anxiety in the face of death. Gradually, the stark Puritan view of death softened, especially after the Great Awakening, uh, which was this really intense religious revival uh, which swept the American colonies in the 1720s. Attitudes towards death uh, begin to change. Where in the 17th century, children were told to fear death, they were increasingly told in the 18th century to look forward to death as a reunion with God and their parents. Adults, in turn, were increasingly assured that a life of piety assured salvation. And this feeling rang true in Patrick Henry's family. Following his death in 1799, uh, Henry's wife, Dorothea Dandridge, wrote to her daughter, quote, He met death with firmness and in full confidence that through the merits of a bleeding Savior that his sins would be pardoned. And changing attitudes in the religious views of death led to changes in how Americans socially confronted it as well. So let's take a look at those, some of those aspects. The pages you see here uh, come from a book titled The New England Primer. And this was a common children's English book, um, first published in the late 17th century. The alphabet woodcuts displayed on the right reflect the violence of the natural world and the brevity of life. While the content of these illustrations may appear grim, especially for children, Puritan parents in New England were confronted with the difficult knowledge of high infant mortality rates and the uh, potential damnation of unrepented children. These works intended to uh, teach and remind children of this danger. The page also uses images from the Bible, which children in the 18th century would have easily recognized. And children were educated in death in more ways than one, as seen here uh, in young Sally Gilbert's penmanship book from 1813. Children's penmanship exercises frequently included writing and rewriting sentences. Many contained brief moral, moral lessons respecting mortality, such as we see here, death summons all men to the grave. Uh, very subtle. And this reminder is of one's ultimate demise, and this is known as a memento mori. Latin for remember that you have to die. Memento mori is an artistic or a symbolic trope acting as a reminder of the inevitability of death. The concept has its roots in ancient Greece and Rome and has appeared in art and literature ever since. The most common motif, which we can see here, is a skull, often accompanied by one or more bones. Often this alone uh, evokes the uh, trope itself, but other motifs such as uh, coffins, hourglasses, and wilting flowers signify the uh, impermanence of human life. Memento mori was commonly used as a warning to the greedy and powerful that such riches cannot be carried into eternity. An example of this is seen in the 1770 woodcut engravings by Bowes and Carter. Now, images of an English noble couple are contrasted by their matching skeletons. Their fine clothes, large properties, and aristocratic pedigrees uh, are confined to their living selves, 
while only their headstones and broken bones remain in death. Each headstone compiles quotes from authors and the Bible concerning mortality. Passages include, quote, Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their grave their latter end. And, quote, they spend their days in wealth and in a moment gone down to the grave. So when Memento Mori finally catches up to you, how do people remember you? Well, in the 18th century, works of art were often commissioned by uh, upper classes as a kind of sentimental imagery. Mourning and sentimental imagery represent a person's desire to retain some tangible memory of loss. Despite Protestant beliefs that death ultimately led to eternal life, the mourning imagery of the 18th century suggests that people felt profound despair when dealing with the death of loved ones. That feeling of anger, frustration, uh, and sadness were uh, common sentiments among the bereaved. One fascinating example of mourning art is this death mask. And a death mask is a cast of a deceased person's face. They originated in the late Middle Ages and were produced in Europe and later in America. These casts were used uh, as objects of memory for the bereaved and as likenesses uh, for the use of portrait painters. At one time, the owner of this watercolor uh, illustration of a death mask believed it to be the representation of Alexander Hamilton. Although no death mask was created from Patrick Henry's face, masks were made from the faces of people like uh, Marie Antoinette, Napoleon, uh, and even John Dillinger, the famous gangster. And today, Red Hill owns several examples of mourning art, including this bracelet, which was commissioned in memory of William Henry, brother to Patrick Henry, uh, who died on January 2nd, 1785. The bracelet would have been worn by a female member of the family during the period of mourning. The image of a fictitious woman crying over a, a fictitious headstone was a popular motif for works of this kind. The custom inscription on the stone bears William's uh, name and death date, as well as the epitaph, life how short, eternity how long. And here is a similar image painted into a brooch, commemorating the death of Patrick Henry. Once again, the fictitious woman cries over Henry's fictitious grave. Uh, both images were once owned by Henry's sister, Jane Henry Meredith, who may have had these commissioned in remembrance of her deceased brothers. The Henry family also engaged in uh, the common practice of hair work to remember the deceased. Hair work acted as a physical reminder uh, for a loved one by literally using pieces of the loved one, in this case, their hair. In the 18th century, hair work was more understated. Uh, mourners might preserve small locks of hair under glass in brooches or rings. But you may be more familiar with the 19th century practice of hair work, uh, which uh, you can see two examples of here, where hair was made into wreaths resembling, uh, resembling flowers. This particular piece of hair work in the Red Hill collection contains hair belonging to Patrick Henry himself. The ring is engraved on the inside band with Henry's name, and the slight red hair of the uh, slight red color, excuse me, of the hair, uh, both indicate this to likely actually being uh, his luscious locks. Uh, now we don't know if Henry's hair was cut before or after his death, uh, but either one is likely. And a second morning ring in our collection uh, is a ring containing the hair of Patrick Henry's mother, Sarah Winston. Before her death in 1785, Sarah likely commissioned this ring. The gray hair inside has been woven together to form uh, a slight pattern, which you can see here on the left. And Sarah, in fact, gave this ring to her son, Patrick, as part of her will, saying in it, quote, I give to my son, Patrick Henry, a mourning ring. The ring served as a reminder uh, that in life, Henry was forced to confront the death of uh, many loved ones. Henry's father died uh, in 1773 and was buried at his Mount Brilliant plantation in Hanover County. And just two years later, tragedy struck again when Henry's wife, Sarah Shelton, died from an unknown cause around the age of 37. Sarah had been dealing with a mental illness for several years before this, so her death no, no doubt brought a heartache to Patrick, who never mentioned her again. She was buried in an unmarked grave, possibly at Scotchtown or uh, Rural Plains Plantation. Patrick's mother died a decade later in 1784. In traditional fashion, Sarah's coffin was placed on view in the parlor of her home, Winton, in Amherst County, 
uh, before she was buried in the family cemetery. And having 17 children uh, also caused Henry to experience death on a regular basis. Of those 17, six died before their father, but interestingly, Henry never knew the sixth child, Anne Roan, had died. Anne's death on May 22nd, 1799, was just one week before Patrick Henry would die. Her distressed husband, Spencer Roan, wrote a letter to Henry on May 24th, uh, informing him of his daughter's death. Quote, with a degree of anguish which I have never before uh, the smallest conception of, I have to announce to you the death of my ever dear and well-beloved Anne. She died two days ago at Mr. Aylett's a week uh, after uh, illness. Patrick Henry, however, never received this letter. When it arrived at Red Hill on June 1st, the family withheld it from Henry, thinking it was too much for him to bear. Another of Henry's children, Edward, nicknamed Nettie, faced death before his father. Apart from the illness and death of his first wife, no concern of Patrick Henry's family life uh, brought him more grief, agony, and sadness than the welfare of Nettie. Poor Nettie, as he was uh, sadly referred to, led a difficult life. He struggled to overcome an abnormal home life and ill health in order to meet the high expectations placed on him as an older son. The youngest son of Sarah Shelton, Edward became motherless at age three. Oldest, older sister Martha and uh, aunt Jane, Henry, Jane Meredith Henry uh, cared for him while their father busily served his country. When the family moved to Salisbury Plantation, the cramped living quarters necessitated boarding Nettie elsewhere. When the Henrys moved to Prince Edward County, Nettie was again sent away uh, and housed to another aunt's house. And in the summer of 1792, he had been struck by a mysterious disease similar to the gout uh, while visiting the home of Colonel William Fleming. The illness particularly afflicted his leg, restricting travel and forcing him to stay at Fleming's until recovery. Patrick Henry felt a deep obligation for their assistance and uh, expressed his gratitude to Colonel Fleming in this letter you see here, which is currently on loan at Red Hill. In it, Henry says, quote, I beg leave to make you uh, my best acknowledgement for your care and attention to my son. I persuade myself that he has that he also entertains a proper sense of gratitude for your goodness. I hope it will not be long before he will render you some comp compensation as evidence of it. Now, luckily, Edward did recover, uh, but he continued to struggle in life as a failed lawyer and lover after his sweetheart, who just so happened to be his cousin, uh, married another man. And in late 1793, another illness forced Nettie to stay at Winton, the home of his Aunt Jane and her husband, Samuel Meredith. Patrick Henry wrote to his daughter Elizabeth in October of 1793, hoping for Nettie's recovery, saying, quote, Poor Nettie has been at the point of death at Colonel Meredith's. He was mended a little when we last heard from him, and there were hopes of his living, and I trust he mends, or we should have heard before this. Nettie would luckily recover. But sadly, after a single visit to Red Hill, poor Nettie died October 1794 at Winton at the age of 23. In memory of his passing, Patrick and his second wife, Dorothea, renamed their newborn infant son, Edward Winston Henry. And as Edward was a Freemason, it was customary among the Masons, at the request of a brother upon his deathbed, to accompany his body to its burial site and to assist in interment. According to the Marshall Lodge of Lynchburg, Virginia, quote, November 5th, 1794, on a motion made and seconded, it is ordered that the worshipful master write Patrick Henry Esquire, requesting permission for the lodge to attend the funeral of brother Edward Henry deceased. Patrick Henry approved the request. According to plan, members from George Lodge 32, Campbell Lodge 40, and Buckingham Lodge 38 marched in form to the town of New Glasgow, where Winton is located, and attended Edward's funeral service. They then marched to his grave site and performed the traditional ceremony, which may have um, included depositing Edward's Masonic apron, an emblem of innocence, and the sprig of evergreen representing the acacia plant, a Masonic symbol of immortality and rebirth in the coffin. In the face of death, Patrick Henry also acted as comforter with words of love and encouragement. Henry's sister, Anne Henry Christian, was dealing with the death of her husband, William, in 1786, when he wrote a consoling letter. In it, Henry updates his progress on securing a tombstone for William and sends his best, best wishes. 
quote, pray write me as to all your affairs, particularly as to your children and your own state of mind, what prospects you have before you. Henry continues, quote, my wife has five very fine and promising children. I rejoice to hear yours are so. Pray, my dearest sister, let me know how I may serve you or them. Alas, death inevitably came to Henry's doorstep, and after 63 years of life, his time had come in June 1799. Since first feeling the gravel in April, Henry had been routinely treated by Dr. George Cabell, a prominent and respected physician from Lynchburg. Henry was 30 years Cabell's senior, but the two families had become connected through family marriages. Sarah Winston Cabell, Dr. Cabell's wife, and Patrick Henry were cousins. Sarah Cabell was the daughter of Judge Edmund Winston, who coincidentally would marry Patrick's widow Dorothea three years after Henry's death. After Henry's death, his son, Alexander Spotswood Henry, married Dr. Cabell's daughter, uh, Paulina. And Dr. Cabell received his education at Hamden Sydney Academy, now Hamden Sydney College, and completed his medical training at the University of Pennsylvania in 1790. And by 1798, Dr. Cabell was practicing in Lynchburg. A year later, he was met with a challenging illness in Henry, which he had likely uh, never faced before. Henry not only missed his election to the House of Delegates, but was confined for long periods between April and June by his infirmity. Undeterred, Dr. Cabell made multiple attempts to cure his patient. On June 1st, racked with pain and fever, Henry wrote to daughter Martha, quote, Dear Patsy, I'm very unwell, and I have Dr. Cabell with me. Henry was fearing the worst. Dr. Cabell had determined Henry's illness to be intussusception, a medical condition in which part of the intestine folds into the section immediately ahead of it, essentially acting like a pirate's telescope. The symptoms exhibited by Henry point to this as a correct diagnosis. Unfortunately, intussusception is fatal within two to five days if not treated. This is because the longer the intestine is folded in, the longer it goes without blood flow. Now, many of you might know the specifics uh, around Patrick Henry's life are hard to come by, uh, as he did not write much down for posterity. However, the day of Henry's death is one of the best documented moments in his entire life. And this is thanks to Henry's great-grandson, Edward Fontaine, uh, seen here on the left. In 1872, concerned with the inaccurate picture Patrick Henry, uh, of Patrick Henry in William Ward's biography of him, uh, Fontaine decided to set the record straight. Using information he had collected over a 40-year period from older family members and friends of Patrick Henry, Fontaine compiled his own um, sketch of Henry. Most of the information about Henry's death came from Edward Fontaine's father, Patrick Henry Fontaine, who was 24 years old when he witnessed his grandfather's last breath at Red Hill. And I'd now like, it, like to take you through that uh, fateful day using Edward Fontaine's words, which have been transcribed by Mark Cuvion, a uh, Patrick Henry scholar from the original manuscript at Cornell University. And yes, I've got to plug the book. Uh, copies of the Fontaine manuscript are available in the Red Hill gift shop. Now, on the morning of Thursday, June 6th, 1799, Patrick Henry's daughter, Martha Fontaine, her son, Patrick Henry Fontaine, her daughter, Martha, and son-in-law, Nathaniel West Dandridge, arrived at Red Hill from Henry County. They found the Patriot sitting in a three-cornered chair uh, made of black walnut. Henry felt the chair provided more comfort than a bed. Henry's conversation with his family was, according to the Fontaine manuscript, quote, almost exclusively upon the subject of religion. He read to them many extracts from Volney's Ruins, which had been recently translated and circulated in Virginia, and gave them a most conclusive and eloquent reply to his arguments against Christianity. He expressed great uneasiness about the propagation in Virginia of the principles of the fascinating writers of the French school of infidelity, and warned them most earnestly and affectionately to save themselves and their families from their baneful influence. The time had come. Dr. Cabell's normal remedies could no longer help, and he tried his last resort. Dr. Cabell handed Patrick Henry a vial of liquid mercury chloride, which was widely used in medicine at this time. The following account is preserved in Fontaine's manuscript as relayed to him by his father. So I'll read you a passage from this right here. 
Quote, he held the dose and looked at it for a moment and said, I suppose, doctor, this was your last resort. He replied, I'm sorry to say, governor, that it is. Acute inflammation of the intestine has already taken place, and unless it is removed, mortification will ensue if it has not already commenced, which I fear. What will be the effect of this medicine? It will give you immediate relief, or, and the kind-hearted physician was too much affected to finish the sentence. But the dying man calmly said, you mean, doctor, that it will give relief or prove fatal immediately? The doctor replied, you can only live a short time without it, and it may possibly relieve you. He then drew a silk cap, which he usually wore instead of his wig, over his eyes and said, excuse me for a few minutes, doctor. And still holding the vial in his hand, he bowed his head sitting in his chair and prayed audibly a childlike fervent prayer for a preparation for death and for the welfare of his family and country. He then swallowed the mercury without any emotion. In the meantime, Dr. Cabell, who was a skeptic, had left the house and overwhelmed with sorrow. He had thrown himself upon the ground underneath one of the trees in the yard where he wept bitterly. But he soon returned to his patient, whom he found sitting looking at the blood congealing under his nails of his fingers and comforting his wife and family weeping around him. Among other things which he said, after expressing his gratitude for the goodness of God to him uh, for all his days, he added, I feel truly thankful to my heavenly father, who after blessing me all my life is permitting me now to die without suffering any pain. His voice was clear and distinct, and his last words were addressed to his friend, Dr. Cabell. He fixed his eyes affectionately upon him and said, Doctor, I have used many arguments to prove to you the truth of the Christian religion. I will now give you my last argument by showing you how a Christian can die. In a few moments more, he ceased to breathe, and without giving the signal of a parting pang to the peaceful body, his mighty spirit passed away from earth and time. But Patrick Henry was dead. News of his passing spread rapidly throughout the Commonwealth and the nation. On June 12th, John Marshall wrote to George Washington, quote, Virginia was sustained a very severe loss, which all good men will long deplore in the death of Mr. Henry. On June 14th, the Virginia Gazette published a particularly mournful article saying, quote, Mourn, Virginia, mourn, your Henry is gone. Ye friends to liberty in every clime, drop a tear. Patrick Henry was buried at Red Hill near a large group of hackberry and black locust trees in the family cemetery. His grave was either unmarked or bore a simple wooden headstone facing east, which kept with Christian tradition so that on the morning of the day of resurrection, the bodies will face their holy father. The grave you see today, and in these images, would not be placed over Henry's body until much later. Nearby was the grave of Henry's infant daughter, Jane Robinson Henry, who had passed a year prior at only four days old. No funeral ceremony was held until July, when on a Sunday morning, Reverend Archibald McRoberts, minister of nearby Hat Creek Presbyterian Church, gave the parting benediction over Henry's grave. The Henry family had uh, entered a period of mourning, which lasted several between several weeks to several months, depending on the social rules of the day. By the 19th century, a widowed woman was expected to be in a state of mourning anywhere from a year and a day after her husband's death or for the rest of her life. In the 18th century, many colonists wore specific outfits to outwardly express their feelings of grief and mourning. Although varied, mourning clothes were plain, usually consisting of dull material without embellishment. Trimmed with white linen or black crepe, uh, dresses were made uh, of bombasine, a blend of uh, wool and silk, with either button or black ribbon closures. On the head, hoods, veils, caps, or any combination of the three uh, were made of and embellished with crepe and silk. Accessories included handkerchiefs or fans. For men, mourning suits were made of woolen material, most likely broadcloth, shalloon, or a combination of the two, with crepe wrapped around the band of a hat. Depending on the wealth of the family, uh, enslaved servants would also receive mourning clothes, although of lesser quality and often only a few pieces. The wealthy could afford to have a set of clothes made specifically for mourning purposes while the poor dyed their everyday wear to serve as mourning clothes. As the development of the Atlantic trade um, facilitated easier means of exchange between Europe and the colonies, 
colonists began to use displays of material goods to project declarations of wealth traditionally limited to the wealthy. Morning materials made available uh, to increasingly wealthier colonists allowed them to participate in traditions previously reserved for European aristocracy. And when we look to Henry's burial, unfortunately, no additional details concerning Henry's exist, but history can help us guess what may have happened. In the late 18th century, the deceased were not often buried in their clothes, as clothing was both laborious to make and a significant expenditure. Clothing in colonial America was often passed down to and altered for younger generations of a family. Instead, most people were buried in shrouds. Shrouds were robes split down the back with ribbons or strings at the openings for the hands and feet, essentially enclosing the deceased uh, within the shroud. The quality of the shroud and the material of which it was made depended on the wealth of the deceased. Uh, rough, cheap fabrics were used when burying the poor, while higher quality fabrics, embellished with ruffles or pleats, as we see here on the left, uh, were used to inter the wealthier. For those who needed to be buried promptly or who did not have a family to attend their burial, winding sheets, usually of uh, Osnaburg, were wound around the body before it was placed in the grave. Henry's shroud, if one was used at all, uh, was likely simple and un unembellished. It's likely Henry's shrouded body was placed in the most popular of burial receptacles, a coffin. As today, coffins came in grades and complexities reflecting real or supposed wealth or social status. The poorest families rented the reusable parish coffin and went to their maker in no more than a winding sheet. The simplest wooden six-sided coffins were of pine, often covered with fabric secured with black painted brass tacks. George Washington's coffin, a replica which is seen here, was made in a similar fashion but with more expensive silver hardware. Now we can't say exactly what Henry's coffin looked like, but again, it was probably very simple. And unlike today where we have craftsmen who specialize in casket construction, the makers of these coffins in the 18th century were called cabinet makers. In addition to coffins, they produced a number of other objects, including furniture or wood items for the home. They're essentially uh, general woodworkers. The image here is of a sign for one such cabinet maker in the city of uh, Newton, Pennsylvania. The sign shows carpenter Henry Van Horn, whose shop opened in 1696, could satisfy, satisfy his customers' needs from cradle to grave. And speaking of graves, as I mentioned before, Henry's was likely unmarked, although it's possible a simple wooden headstone was used but quickly rotted away. So where did this marker come from? It's thanks to Patrick and Dorothea's youngest son, John, that these stones were placed here. In 1857, John inquired about the creation of a permanent stone marker at the site of Patrick and Dorothea's graves. On January 9th, 1857, John received this letter from a stonemason named Kellogg in Milton, North Carolina, with a proposed design of Henry's new marker. This design included a large marble slab held atop four marble pillars. This design was never realized, but it is obviously inspired by 18th century markers of a similar style. These are known as uh, table graves. And pressure from the public may have had something to do with John Henry's placement of these markers. In February 1857, the Richmond Dispatch newspaper reprinted an excerpt from the Milton, North Carolina Chronicle, which angrily told uh, of Virginia's negligence to place a permanent marker at Henry's grave. The article further claimed that the placement of a bronze statue of Patrick Henry in Richmond had inspired, quote, a few of his relatives to place a marble slab over his remains. Not long after, in 1858, uh, did John place a marker over his father's grave. The marker is designed as a box tomb with sandstone walls supporting a marble slab. The stone used for the walls was quarried at Red Hill. In keeping with Patrick Henry's uh, simple style, John restricted the design of the stone to only a few leaves and a script font. The epitaph appropriately reads, quote, his fame, his best epitaph. And since the installation of Henry's gravestone, uh, it has survived remarkably intact over the years. 
Visitors throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries would call on Henry's descendants for a chance to see the famed orator's resting place. And as you can see here on the right, some of them did succeed. Uh, those two ladies standing in front of the grave are members of the uh, colonial dames. Now today, the Patrick Henry Memorial Foundation cares for the entire Henry family cemetery. That includes Patrick and Dorothea, along with a couple of their sons, Alexander Spotswood and John, uh, John's wife, Elvira, uh, John and Elvira's daughter, Maura Helen Carter, along with a uh, great granddaughter who died as an infant. His name was also John. Uh, and it is our uh, responsibility to, of course, care for the Henry Family Cemetery and ensure its preservation for generations to come. And with that, I hope you have enjoyed the presentation. I thank all of you for attending. And if you'd like to ask any questions in the chats uh, about anything I just presented on, feel free to do so. Uh, but if you have longer questions, email, phone numbers here, uh, along with our uh, website. So I'll give people a few minutes if they want to ask any questions, and then we will wrap it up for the day. Thank you to uh, Mike and Kelly on Facebook. Uh, they both said this was a great presentation. I appreciate you both, and we hope to see you at Red Hill soon. All right, Kelly asked, who else is buried at Red Hill? This is a great question. Uh, we actually have three uh, known separate burial places at Red Hill. One, of course, is the Henry Family Cemetery, um, and I just listed who is buried there. Those are all members of the Henry family whose graves are marked. In fact, there's some other members of the Henry family who are buried in that location, but their graves are not marked. Um, for instance, Patrick's youngest daughter, uh, Jane Robinson, she lived for four days, died in 1798, uh, and she uh, is buried there possibly as well. Uh, we believe that another of Patrick Henry's sons, Fayette Henry, and his wife may be buried there. Um, and there's some other graves whose names we haven't been able to, uh, to place. In addition to that, uh, we have the uh, Quarter Place Cemetery, which uh, is just uh, north of the Henry Cemetery. This is the location of uh, 147 burials, all African Americans. Uh, we believe the cemetery could date back to the 1770s, but certainly to the 1790s when Patrick Henry was here. And it's been used by uh, originally enslaved African Americans and then free African Americans up to the latest uh, burial we have now is uh, 1937. And of all those graves, only one of those headstones are uh, inscribed with a name. Every other grave is either marked with a headstone and a footstone, or a headstone, or they're not marked at all. And the final area is uh, was actually not known to be a possible burial, burial ground until about 2019, 2020, when archaeologists discovered three uh, grave shafts. And this is in a separate location from the Quarter Place Cemetery, but it is still on the Quarter Place Trail. So we're trying to find out a bit more about those three uh, graves uh, using archaeology. Good question, Kelly. Anyone else before we wrap it up? All right. Well, folks, again, thank you very much for uh, joining me on this uh, lovely Saturday morning. And uh, I hope you enjoy your fall and happy Halloween. Thank you again, everyone. Bye-bye.